Let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. The Signal Oil Program, bringing you another strange tale by The Whistler. Tonight, the story of a weird game of murder, of a threat which brought the deadly answer, not if I kill you first. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. But first, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about Joe Jager's signal gasoline station in Oakland, California. It's busy as a beehive, hours before most alarm clocks begin to jingle. Joe opens his signal station at the cold gray hour of 4.45 to get ready for early morning defense workers because, as Joe puts it, their jobs are helping win the war, and I'm glad to serve them. During the day, Joe finds time for another unusual service. Many servicemen's families don't have cameras, so with his fine speed graphic... Joe takes pictures of them for mailing to their men overseas. Well, we can't expect all signal dealers to open at 445 and take pictures for servicemen, as Joe Jager does. But every signal dealer has his own way of delivering extra services, even these days. That's because signal gasoline dealers don't operate just for today. With them, serving you is their permanent business and will be through years to come. They know your car needs even better service today, when it must last out the duration and parts are hard to get. That's why friendly signal dealers give the thorough, conscientious kind of service you can depend on. And that's why more and more drivers are finding out that to make your present car go farther, a mighty good man to know is your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. And now, the whistler. You probably didn't notice the item in your morning paper. It wasn't very prominent. Just a squib on the sixth page about another jewel robbery. $50,000 in sparklers missing from one of the homes out on the hill. Not much of a story because there doesn't seem to be any mystery about it. As the chief of detectives told the reporters... Simple as ABC. We knew it was in an inside job because there's no sign of forced entry. Whoever did it got in the house with an ordinary house key. And not only that, but we found a screwdriver under a chair. It matched up with the marks on the jewel drawer where he jimmied it open. And that screwdriver came out of one of the family cars. So we start looking around. There's a maid, cook, chauffeur gardener. We look up their records, found out this chauffeur is an ex-con. Served two terms for burglary. And there you are. He wasn't very smart. Yes, it was very simple, wasn't it, officer? It makes no difference that the ex-con turned chauffeur swore he had nothing to do with it. Swore to you he's been trying to go straight. No, you're convinced. Only maybe if you knew what I do, officer, you might not be so certain. If you could see the little room over on First Avenue where young, tough Sammy Copeland is waiting for a business partner, pacing the floor, peeking out around a drawn blind, getting nervous. Maybe you'd be interested in the conversation when his business partner arrives. Albert Easley, cheap, dapper, and proud of it. Okay, Sammy, relax. Uh, It took you long enough. Where you been? I said relax. You're in the big time now. You can't just dump $50,000 in hot rocks like your pawn a watch. Takes a little time, some diplomacy. You have to sit down and chat with the fence a while. I'll be sociable. Here, pull up a chair. Nuts. The main thing is, did you get it? It's all here, right in the briefcase. How do you like it? Yeah. Yeah, look at it. 50,000 clams. 
50,000? Shows your inexperience, son. There's only 30,000 here. 30? But you said those rocks was worth 50. The paper this morning Sure, said sure, 50. sure. But you don't think your pencil will give you the full value on hot rocks? He's taking a risk, too. He's got to have some profit. We got 30 for him. Oh, uh, yeah? How do I know that? What do you mean? I mean, how do I know you ain't got the other 20 catched out somewhere? Listen, Squirt, you trust me. See, that's how you know. Now, relax, like I said, and be a good boy. You got nothing to worry about as long as you stick with me. Now I'll count out your 15,000. I want more than that. I want 25. What? And leave me only five? That's a fine way to treat a partner. I don't care about you. I want what's coming to me. You'll get it and no more. We split this 50-50. Well, why should we... Why should you get half? I did the job. I went in and got the stuff. I took all the risk. All you did was sit here and wait for me. Is that so? All I did is sit here and wait for you. Why, you runny-nosed little brat. Who do you think does your thinking for you? How far do you think you'd give that stupid brain of yours? I don't need you. No? How much of this 30000 do you think you'd have now if it wasn't for me? I'll tell you, not one cent. Who found out about the jewels in the first place? Me! Who cased the joint and found out about the chauffeur being an ex-con? Who swiped his screwdriver to plant on the scene? Who figured out every angle to make this one of the neatest jobs ever pulled in this burg? Now, you'd be so stinking hot with the police right now if it hadn't been for me, you'd never even be able to cash the rocks in. And now don't give me any more of this stuff. Now, listen, Easley, I'm sick of you playing a big shot. Maybe you did do all the thinking up to now. But maybe now it's my turn. I've taken 25 of that pile, and you ain't got nothing to say about it. Why, you... Well, you little rat. You'd pull a rod on me. Yeah. And I know how to use it, big shot. Now get counting. 25 for me, 5 for you. How do you like that? Is that a way to treat a pal, Sammy? I'm no pal of yours, big shot. I can take care of myself. Okay, okay. It's 25 for you and 5 for me. Only if you're so smart. Why not take the whole thing? I might do that. Okay, then here, take it. Hey, what the... Now drop that rod. That's better. I'll just keep this little rod for a souvenir. Oh, you jerk. Yes, that'll teach you not to play rough with Albert Easley. You see, Sonny, you're not as smart as you thought. I'm always just a little bit smarter. Now get up and beat it. Go on. What about my money? Oh, you're so impulsive. I don't think you better have so much money around loose, Sammy. Maybe I better keep it for you. Until you grow up a little. Come around sometime when you've learned not to be a double-crossing baby. I'll kill you, Weasley. So help me, I'll kill you. Sure, sure. I'm scared to death. You will be before I'm through, I promise you. Okay, okay, we get going before I take you over my knees. You better order your flowers now, big shot. Because I'll get you if it's the last thing I do. Okay, go ahead and try it, Sammy. But just remember, two can play that game. I could plug you now if I felt like it. But I'll outsmart you at that game, too. We'll see about that. Just remember, Easley, I'm going to kill you. Not if I kill you first, Sammy. Okay, fair enough. So long, Easley. Pleasant dreams. Well, now, a pleasant pair, don't you think? The kind who make a game of murder and may the best man win. Winner gets the 30 Gs. Loser gets six feet of mud in his face. But then Albert the Big Shot isn't worried yet. Maybe he didn't take Sammy seriously at first. But then that afternoon, Evening something Herald, happened. Evening Herald, paper, allies, Vance on Rhine, read all about it, paper. Well, hello there, Sonny, I'll have one. Well, hi, Mr. Easley. Here you are. Thanks, honey. Well, keep the chain. Good night. Gee, thanks, Mr. Easley. Hey, Mr. Easley, look out, look out. Jiminy, Mr. Easley. That was a close one. That guy looked like he was almost trying to hit you. Yeah. Yes, he wasn't fooling. Huh? Uh, thanks, honey, for yelling at me. Guess I'll have to be more careful crossing streets after this. Yes. Now you realize this is a pretty deadly game you're playing, don't you, Albert? You know it's just possible this kid Sammy might outsmart you. He might get you. He may get sent up for it, but he'll stalk you through the streets like an animal until he gets his chance. Yes, maybe you better figure something out, Albert. Do a little thinking about it. Talk it over with somebody. Dolores, maybe. She can keep your secrets okay, as long as you're spending the heavy sugar on her. Sure, talk it over. I'm not worried, you understand. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, I'm not a common gunman. I live by my brain. Albert, stop pacing up and down. You're getting yourself all upset. 
Besides, it's four in the morning and I have to go home. Upset? Well, who wouldn't be upset? Everywhere I go, the guy's on my tail. I can't go out in the street. as I've been waiting in the doorway. Go to my favorite restaurant, I see him sitting there through the window waiting for me. He's everywhere. You're afraid of him, aren't you? Afraid? No, I'm not afraid of him. Okay, so you're not afraid of him. Why not let me go get some tickets to Miami? You need the rest. No, I'm staying here. And get this straight. I'm not afraid of him. Maybe he is out to get me. So what? He's not smart enough. Look at that car trick. That's stupid. He's not going to get me with tricks like that. I've got nothing to worry about. Okay. Now, how about taking me home? It's too late. I need some sleep. You take my car. The keys are there on the table. <laughs> okay, Sir Lancelot. But don't forget, you're no safer right here than you would be taking me home. Shut up. Okay. Okay, sugar. I'm just kidding. I don't suppose you can spare the time to see me to your penthouse door. You know the way. That's what I thought. Well, my mother told me there'd be nights like this. Anyway... Wait a minute. What is it now? Shut up. You hear anything? Hear anything? No. What? I don't know. It's just noise. No, he's hearing things. Shut up. There. Oh, yeah, I did hear something. What was it? How should I know? But there's somebody up here on the roof outside my apartment. Oh, maybe it's only the wind. The wind. Listen. Yeah, there's somebody walking around out there. Turn off that light. Hurry. Okay. Quiet. Don't move. Sugar. I, I see it. A shadow on the window. He's at the door. He's trying to open it. I'll get him. All right, put up your hands. Oh, oh please, please, don't shoot, don't shoot. It's me, O'Brien, the night janitor. O'Brien? Yes. Turn on the lights, Dolores. Yeah. Oh, yes, it's me, Mr. Easley. Oh, for the love of heaven, don't shoot. Ryan, what are you doing up here? Well, somebody left a skylight open, and I come up to shut it. I, I saw a light here, and then it went off, and I just thought I'd better try your door to see nobody get in. I I didn't mean to frighten you, Mr. Easley. It's all right, O'Brien, it's all right. Go on, forget about it. It's a little something for your trouble. Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. O'Brien the janitor. <laughs> you see, we've been worried about shadows. Well, maybe you can laugh, but I've got the jit as good. I need a drink. Okay, you know where to find it. I'm going to bed. O'Brien. <laughs> I should have known. Sammy's not smart enough to try to get me here in the apartment. Hey, don't you want to join me in a drink? With no, me? no, thanks. This bedroom's the last stop for me tonight. <laughs> I think I'm going to get the best night's sleep I've had in a long time. You know, Dolores, I'd bet... Yeah, I'm listening, Albert. What's the matter? Dolores. Come here. Where are you? Oh, in the bedroom. Well, what's the matter? What do you just stand there for? Look. The bed. <gasps> Albert. What is it? A knife. Big enough to split a skull. A knife? What's it doing sticking in your bed? It was thrown there, probably through that window. Somebody who thought I'd be there asleep. Sammy. That's why the skylight was open. He came up here. Yes. There's no imagining this. Sammy wasn't kidding. He wasn't kidding. He out to get me. Yeah. And you're not afraid, are you, sugar? <laughs> You are listening to the Signal Oil Program. Let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Now you know, don't you, Albert? There's no telling yourself it might not have been Sammy. You know now that he does mean to kill you, unless you can kill him first. And now you've got to think. Think hard to figure out a way to outwit him. You won't have much time. Maybe his next attempt will be more successful. And it might come any time. Any time. Who's there? It's me, Dolores. Okay. Whew. Got this place closed up tighter in a jail. Why not open a few windows? It's stuffy. Never mind. I like it this way. Okay, but in broad daylight... I like said it. I like it this way. Okay, don't snap at me. I brought your paper. Figured you wouldn't want to walk down the corner for it. Thanks. I was down at the station today. Priced two tickets to Miami. 
We can get reservations Thursday. I said I wasn't going anywhere. Okay, no harm in just price and tickets, is there? Bring cigarettes? Yeah, right here. Oh, while I was down there in the district around the station, a very funny thing happened. I thought I saw you. Very funny. You know I've been here all day. I know, I know, but that's why it was so funny. This guy looked exactly like you. Huh? He fooled even me. I walked right up to him and said, Well, Sugar, what are you doing down here? And then I see by the way he looks at me, it wasn't you at all. It was some other guy. Oh. <laughs> you got a double running around town. Very funny. Think what a mistake a girl could make in a situation like hey, that. Hey, hey, wait a minute. You're not exaggerating, Dolores. You mean this guy really could have been me? Fooled you completely? I went right up to him and spoke to him. I don't know what he could have thought of me, but I nearly slapped his face for the look he gave me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that gives me an idea. Well, it's the idea I've been waiting for. It's made to order. What do you mean? Well, don't you get it? I got a double. There's two Albert Easleys. Well, that's what I've been telling you, Sugar. Only his name isn't Albert Easley. It's Parker. Parker. I heard the fruit man on the corner say good afternoon, Mr. Parker, to him when he went by. Oh, darling, it's perfect. A perfect alibi. I don't get it. Oh, never mind now. Say, where did you see him? Down on 14th Street near the station. And he seemed to be known around there? Well, the fruit man said... Okay, okay, baby, take it easy. I'll be back sometime this afternoon. Where are you going? Down to 14th Street to look up an alibi. <laughs> Now, this is more like it, Albert. Now you've got an idea. That brain of yours is going full tilt, and you've got a feeling you're just about to outsmart Sammy, but good. You're down on 14th Street, passing the fruit stand when... Hello there, Mr. Parker. Can I sell you some nice fruit today? I beg your pardon? Oh, we got us some nice apples. The kind that you like. I, uh, I thought you called me Mr. Parker. Why, sure. What else should I call you? Well, my name's not Parker. No. Say, wait a minute. You are not the Mr. Parker, are you? No. You talk like him, a little older, maybe. And you sure look like him. A dead ring. Only your suit is a different. You mean I've got a double around well, here? Well, you sure I have a mister. Bill Parker. He lives right down the street there in Mrs. Humphrey's boarding house. Uh, you sure you ain't his twin brother? I'm afraid not. You see, I haven't got a brother. But, you know, I I'd certainly like to see this guy you... Suppose he's home now? No, I'm a pretty sure he's a nut. He always goes down to the theater district in the afternoon. He's an actor. Uh, between the engagements, you might say. Oh, I see. Well, thanks a lot. Maybe I'll look up this Bill Parker. I'd, I'd like to see a guy who looks just like me. Yes, you'll look him up all right, Albert. You hang around his street all day watching for him. Finally, he comes home, and you get a good look at him from across the street. But it's not enough. You're there the next day when he goes out, and again when he comes back. And the next day, you notice everything about him. It's easy to find out how he talks. Just question some of the people along the street. People who are surprised that you're not Parker. Then, to make doubly sure, you take the final step. Try it once. Oh, just for a minute, Mrs. Humphreys. I forgot something. Run up to my room for a second. Well, here you're forgetting your key. What? Oh, yes. I, I forgot I left it with you. Well, Mr. Parker, you always leave it with me. Yeah, what? Oh, yes, so I do. Uh, uh, did you get to see Mr. Silver, the producer? No, not yet. Oh, dear. I do hope he'll see you. I know how much you're counting on that part, Mr. Parker. And we're all pulling for you. Sure, and I lit a candle for you this morning. Thank you, Mrs. Humphreys. <laughs> so it's sure to happen today. And you won't forget dinner tonight. We're going to have potteros. But, Mrs. Humphreys, I... No buts about it. You've got to get some meat on your bones. One hot meal a week isn't too much. We'll be expecting you at six now, Mr. Parker. All right. Hmm. <laughs> it's a cinch. A cinch, sure. Even his landlady, who sees him every day, didn't suspect you weren't Parker. A few minutes in his room, and now you're ready. You get Dolores and give her the setup. It's bound to work. It's beautiful, a perfect alibi. Look, Sammy's going to be at Charlie's Club tonight. I plug him on the dot of eight, and at exactly the same time, Albert Easley walks into the Hotel Commodore five miles away. Only it isn't Albert Easley. That's right, it's Bill Parker. Well, nobody's going to know that. Hey, one thing. How do you get Parker to show up at the Hotel Commodore on the dot of eight? That's where you fit in, baby. Oh? See, this Parker's an actor. 
trying to get apart from him, Mr. Silver. It's his only chance. He's been starving to death. Okay, you get on the phone, call Mrs. Humphreys. Tell her to have Parker at the Hotel Commodore on the dot of eight to see Mr. Silver in his room about the part in his new play. Your Silver secretary. But don't worry about Parker. He'll show up okay. <laughs> been trying to see Silver for a week. Oh, I get it. But what happens when he shows up there and there's no Mr. Silver? Well, he just figures somebody made a mistake. Maybe try some other hotels. But the desk clerk will remember what he looks like and when he came in. He'll identify me when the cops ask him and Parker will never be bothered. Sounds pretty good. It's foolproof. I thought of every angle. I even went through his closet and, and, and bought suits that look just like his. I'll have them in my wardrobe so one of them will check with Parker's description at the hotel. Oh, baby, I figured everything out. Nothing can go wrong. Yeah. Maybe you're smarter than I thought. Smarter than Sammy thought. And all I got to do is call this guy on the phone, huh? That's all. Then tonight, a few minutes before 8, you take my car, park it in a red zone in front of the Commodore, and get out quick without anybody seeing you. In a red zone? But you'll get a ticket. Oh, dear, that's just the idea. At 8 o'clock, the cop on the corner makes his last checkup on parked cars. I checked up on that. After I plug Sammy, I race uptown in a cab, pick up the car, have a traffic ticket in my pocket, date at 8 o'clock in front of the Commodore. <laughs> Just another piece of my alibi. That's pretty clever. Sure, that's what I've been telling you. Albert Easley's a smart guy. A very smart guy. Yes, you're a smart guy, all right, Albert. It's all figured out. Dolores makes the call. Parker will be there. She drops you down near Charlie's club and goes on to park the car. You sneak in the back way, up the hall. The door's ajar. There's Sammy, sitting there, half-facing you. He's grinning about something, looking satisfied. You'll soon fix that. Yes, you wiped the grin off his face, and nobody saw you. You're out the back way before anybody has the sense to look for you. Into a cab, hurrying uptown, to the Commodore. Yes, there's your car. And even before you get to it, you can see the traffic ticket fluttering from the windshield. Everything's okay. It's perfect. Yes, perfect. You're home now, in your dressing gown. The traffic ticket on the table. The suits that look like Parker's hanging in the closet. You're just waiting for the cops. And you don't have long to wait. Yes? Uh, you Albert Easley? Yeah. I'm from headquarters. Oh, come in. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Okay, go ahead. Now, uh, where were you tonight around eight? Eight to... Why, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yes, it must have been just about eight when I stopped in the Commodore to see a friend. What was his name? Uh, Mr. Silver. Well, you know, funny thing, he wasn't registered there. I'd been missing for him. You can prove that? Of course, Yes, I thoughtlessly parked in a red zone outside the hotel and got a ticket. There it is on the table. Mm-hmm. I see. Uh, this proves your car was there. What about you? Well, the desk clerk will remember me, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll see about that. In the meantime, you'd better come along with me easily. If what you say checks, you'll probably be okay. If not... You might be held on suspicion of murder. So far, so good. Just what you expected, wasn't it, Albert? The detective takes a look at your suits before you go, questions you as to what you had on. You can't remember uh, one of those in there. So no matter what Parker was wearing, it'll check... Then down at headquarters, you parry all the questions and insist that the desk clerk be brought in to identify you. Finally, he is. Okay. Now, well, this is Mr. Arnold, the clerk who was on duty at the Hotel Commodore at 8 o'clock this evening. Now, uh, do you recognize this man, Mr. Arnold? No, I, I never saw him before. What? Well, don't you remember? I came in and asked you for Mr. Silver tonight at 8. Nobody resembling you came in tonight and asked for Mr. Silver. Sure, I'd remember that, but no one did. Huh? Oh, you... you... You must be mistaken. No, I'm sure I'm not. 
I've never seen this man or anyone who looks like him. In a moment, the whistler will be back to tell you what really happened to the perfect alibi. Meantime, I'd like to pass along some facts I just found out on the battery situation. Did you know that last winter, so many batteries needed replacing, the demand for new batteries actually exceeded the supply by 25%? Yes, and this year, the demand is likely to be even greater. All cars are a year older, and ration driving is tough on batteries. What's more, with our motorized armies advancing at full speed, the military's demand for batteries will reach an all-time high. Now, I'm no crystal gazer, so I can't predict whether this winter's supply of batteries will be enough to go around. But I do know that your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer has just received a fresh stock of top-quality batteries built to signal's rigid specifications for longer service. Batteries so fine, they're fully guaranteed up to two years. In my way of thinking... That makes right now the time to have your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer inspect your battery. Then, if you need a new one, you can be sure of getting one of those guaranteed quality signal deluxe batteries. And now, back to the whistler. <laughs> And so Albert Easley wasn't as smart as he thought he was. The perfect alibi blew up somehow. And now he's going to stand trial for the murder of Sammy Copeland. Sitting in his cell, going over every detail, he can't figure out what happened, what could have gone wrong. He has only one satisfaction now. At least he outsmarted Sammy. He got Sammy before the kid could get him. Or did he? You see, Albert, that's the part you don't know about. That's why your alibi failed you. Because Sammy did get you first. When you shot him at 8 o'clock, you interrupted his celebration of your death. Yours, Albert. Only it wasn't yours at all. The police might have told you that they found the body of a man that night. A man who looked enough like you to have been your twin brother. His name was Parker. Bill Parker. And your mistake was in not realizing that if you accidentally ran across him, Sammy might too. Only Sammy didn't look too closely. He simply unloaded that rod of his. And that's why your alibi didn't show up. Yes, you were pretty smart, Albert. But sometimes the smart ones have to pay off too. And Sammy got you after all. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, the Signal Oil program will bring you another strange tale by The Whistler. The Signal Oil program is broadcast for your entertainment by The Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal's famous Go Farther gasoline and motor oil, and by your neighborhood Signal Oil dealer, who is at your service daily to keep your car running for the duration. The Signal Oil program Directed by George W. Allen, with story by John Everett Hudson and music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bill Pennell speaking for your friend, the Signal Oil Company, and suggesting once again that you let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>